Okay, and now we do a formal start. Welcome back, everybody, if you're walking in from the other breakout sessions. It's amazing to have you here because we have another exciting but also final thematic plenary session for you in store. And fitting to the fact that this is the final thematic, don't worry, we have more plenary sessions happening, but this is the final thematic one, uh, entirely fitting with that topic. This one will specifically look forward to what an agenda on research and innovation when it comes to climate and health should include. And we'll have speakers that will dive deeper into that and really look at how can we make it inclusive? How can we make sure that in the process of developing such an agenda, we engage different stakeholders? I mean, right, that's a, that's a point that has been repeatedly mentioned throughout these two days by, uh, by many people. Uh, the inclusivity of it, who do you include? Can you make it out of the box? Uh, we'll be thinking about which bridges need to be uh, overbridged, which gaps need to be overbridged. I'm making the same uh, hiccup as the previous panel, gapping bridges. <laughs> but we'll also be answering to the question, what are some of the urgent challenges that we'll be facing in these upcoming years? So a lot that we're going to try to very ambitiously pack in this session. But before we do, and before we dive into that, as always, I would also like to hear from you, our audience, uh, because we have a little Slido poll for you again that you can fill out. If you pull out your phone, and if you scan this QR code, then I am very curious to hear from you in an agenda. So in, in an agenda surrounding the topic of climate and, um, and health, uh, what, what cannot be forgotten in a future research and innovation agenda when we make it? So uh, while you fill that out, please do, because this input will all be taken along. I will explain the format for this session. Now, uh, to those of you that were here in the second session yesterday, you might remember that we had presentations from our amazing speakers, but then that we ended on a statement well, I can tell you the speakers for today, they worked hard, they cracked their brains and they prepared statements for you again. So in a little bit, we'll have presentations by our speakers. They'll end on a statement and then we will turn to you, our audience, with a simple question. Do you agree with the statement or do you disagree? You know the drill perhaps from yesterday, but if you weren't there, if you agree with the statement, then you stand. And if you disagree, you remain seated, ever so simple, right? Just the fact that you need to make up your mind about whether you agree or disagree is less simple, but we'll get to that when we get there. Um, that being said, it is also important to note that if you have any questions, please do send them in. Slido will be open, and if we have the time for it, it's nice to take one or two questions here and there. Uh, but with that being said, let's turn to the poll, because you are sending in lots of answers, things that cannot be forgotten in a future research and innovation agenda, mental health, I see it's the most upvoted one, technology, one health, inequities, patient safety, curiosity, life course perspective, but also things such as social justice, pollutants, many things. I won't read them all, but I think this is amazing input for the organizing theme. As I said, everything that you say here will be used in the draft uh, uh, of that strategy and future um, uh, research and innovation agenda. So uh, know that your effort is going to reap its rewards. And with that being said, I won't keep you in suspense any longer. I'll say, let's start with the first presentation for this plenary session. And I'm very delighted that I'm able to welcome to the floor as a first speaker. He is the director of the Climate and Health Division at Wellcome Trust. Everybody, can we get a big round of applause for none other than Alan Dengur? <laughs> and the floor is yours. <laughs> Enjoy. And, um, Thank you very much. I'll take this away. Then you have a... Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, I'd like to start, if I may, just with a, a, a vote of thanks, and I hope you'll join me with this, uh, for Carmen La, uh, La, La Plaza Santos and Rita Araujo, who really have organized this meeting, and I think it's astonishing what they've achieved. So if you will join me in a round of applause. Um, I'm really pleased, so thank you. I'm really, really pleased to be here, and it's really exciting to see these last two days, the discussions we've had. I know that this session stands between you and lunch, so I'm going to be fast. Um, I'm, so I'm very fortunate to be leading the team at Welcome uh, uh, on uh, the intersection between climate and health. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Welcome is a politically and financially independent charity based in London, but we work globally. Uh, we've got a very large uh, um, 
fund which enables us to spend, uh, we've committed to spending 16 billion pounds over the next 10 years, and that spend is on research, primarily on research which is health focused, and I'm very privileged to be leading the, the, the program on the intersection between climate and health. So, um, this session is really about uh, supporting a global research agenda, um, and I really want us to step back a little bit, move out of Brussels, move even dare to move out of Europe and look at the world. Um, you've heard over the last, uh, so yesterday has been particular from Andy Haynes and others and uh, M Marina Rominello, um, the real state of the world and uh, the impacts of climate, uh, climate change is already having on health and frankly the real trouble we're in. Uh, we've heard just now some great talks about mitigation and adaptation uh, and the opportunities that, that, that there are there. So I'm not going to repeat any of that. I'm just going to, I've got a couple of slides about the state of science in this area and then a couple of, uh, a sort of slightly more provocative slide about what we need to do. So uh, on the state of science, I've got up here the three key areas, of course, impacts, adaptation and mitigation. So I would say, so that figure you saw yesterday as well, um, Jan Minx is in the room, uh, Jan and Andy and uh, Leah Barangford and I worked on that paper. And what that bit of the graph, the map really shows you is that we've got, where there's loads of dots, there's loads of evidence. And where there are very few dots, there is no evidence. So look where there's no evidence. Look at the parts of the world that you can imagine or, or you know are already significantly, we've got the Minister Chiponda here from Malawi, significantly aff affected by climate change. There's not enough evidence in the parts of the world that are significantly struggling with the impacts of climate change already. So there's an un unequal evidence base, and I would say there are some underdeveloped methods in this area. Uh, there's also, uh, we need, you know, there's interdisciplinary science going on. Uh, those are very mixed in the way they, d and they work, and I'll come back to that. Um, and, uh, but this evidence on the impact is what drives action. So once you know the impact, then you drive the action, and that leads to the adaptation and mitigation options, of course, that are developed. So that makes impact so important. Then when we go to adaptation, we just heard from Shari and from others on the previous panel in this room uh, that whilst there are loads of adaptations that are being tried, to, uh, uh, actually those that protect health are poorly defined. There's very limited evidence that uh, which adaptation actions, especially in low and middle income countries, actually protect health. And also the evaluation methods are very complicated and they're not really robust against uh, climate uncertainty. So if you, if you develop an intervention, you deliver that intervention and it rolls out for 10 years in an uncertain climate, the evaluation of that, the impact of that is very complicated and the methods aren't there. And then on mitigation, the work we've seen to date is largely focused on the really, really important and frankly huge uh, co-benefits of mitigation, or as Maria Nehra said yesterday, the benefits of mitigation uh, policies. A lot of that's been done at the sectoral level, so transport or food systems. So the, the, the integration of those sectoral uh, approaches is poorly defined and how that should be done. And of course, of course, the most important thing for policymakers is the economic benefits, also very poorly defined at the moment. And as Andy said yesterday, and as the Pathfinder initiative that we are proud to support as well uh, has shown, there's almost no evidence evaluating the real impacts on people of mitigation policies. Most of it is modelled. So, and then two other things on the state of the field. Uh, number one, on methods and capacity. This is a new area, so let's not kid ourselves that we know how to do this. This is a very new area, and what's clear we've heard today is it requires transdisciplinary science. It requires scientists talking to each other from various areas, and that's being patchily done, let's call it. It's patchy the way it's done, and there are many methods that are still missing. The climate data and the health data are very siloed. Can I just ask you, please put your hand up if you work in a health-related field. Please put your hand up now if you work in meteorology or climatology. So, there we go. So, a thank you for being here, number one, but it's a tiny fraction of the people in the room. So, if you want silos, there we have a silo. Um, and, of course, the talent is very unequally distributed. There's lots of people in London who, and here in Brussels and places who know how to work, and the talent is very poorly distributed. And then on policy and influencing, and this goes to some of the discussions we've had at COP and other places, there are loads of climate policy frameworks. They don't yet fully integrate health. There are continued gaps, uh, as we've just talked about, between climate and health scientists, and much more funding is needed uh, to support transdisciplinary uh, climate and health research. We made a commitment at COP 
uh, this financial year to spend at least 100 million pounds from Wellcome on this research agenda, but that's a drop in the ocean for what really needs, we need. So the climate and health strategy, and I know that Jeremy Farrow is in the room now, uh, this, is, uh, this, this, this emerged under his watch, and I'm hugely privileged to be running this. Uh, we have this mission of putting health at the heart of climate change action, and we have two major activities. One is a transformation in the generation uh, and use, so it's both the generation and the use of research evidence, and the other one is shaping the field. So on the transformation in the generation of use, it's on the impacts, what are the impacts, where are they, uh, how are they going to affect people, who is affected. Uh, the second thing, of course, is on what are the mitigation actions that are best, best supportive of health, have the greatest benefits for health, and the thirdly, which are the adaptation actions that are really going to protect health. So a huge emphasis, and you'll notice that none of those are esoteric questions about, I wonder what happens if this, start, if, you know, A versus B. These are really important questions that are driven at, at policy change, informing policy, informing action, uh, given the urgency uh, of, the, of the problem. And then the second thing we're trying to do at Welcome is build a field. Build a field of researchers, build a field of activists, build a field of advocates and funders who recognize the importance of the impact of climate change and really want to drive a change. So I'm going to, this is my, I think my final slide. I've got five things I just want to ask us all. Uh, put up your hand if you were taught uh, at university or at college or where, uh, where you went about the intersection between climate change and health. Okay, thank you. Put up your hand if you're at an institution that actively now teaches this. We just heard that uh, Angelina at the Robert Koch now teaches this, so there's at least one person. Okay, again, and of course London School and a few others. So there's, but it's, it's a really small number of institutions globally that are teaching about the intersection of climate and change and health. We're teaching the next generation the wrong thing. Yeah? Public health without climate change just doesn't make sense anymore. So the first thing is, are we teaching the right thing? The second thing is, what are the questions we're asking? Are we asking the questions, the research questions? Are we asking our funders? Are we asking our governments the right questions about this intersection? How do we make sure that we ask the right section? Who should set those questions? Who is involved in designing and developing those questions? Are they consequential? Are, will they lead to policy action and policy change? Urgency. I was form formerly a very, very happy academic, and let me tell you, it takes years to write a paper, I promise, yeah? Ha ha. It shouldn't take years to write a paper. We should get on with it, we should write that paper, we should write the policy brief, and we should push for urgent action. It's taking far too long, this agenda, and we need to accelerate the urgency. We cannot pretend that our, our, the work that we do, just because we're trying to save the world, has no environmental footprint. So we all need to start thinking about our environmental footprint of the work we do. Uh, and at Wellcome, we're taking this very seriously, and I'm very hopeful that there'll be new policies at Wellcome if we receive funding that will drive down the environmental footprint of the research that we fund. I think it's essential that we recognize that this cannot, we cannot just carry on in the same way. And finally, and it's, this could not be more important, who are we including in this activity? What voices are we asking to hear? What voices are we listening to? Who is part of the process? So that's not only what disciplines, what people, what communities, what individuals. And we're not being anywhere near inclusive enough, and I think that has got to change. So I think that's all I've got time for, because I know lunch is coming. I do have my statement, though. Do you want yes. so, yes. so having said all of that, so you asked this morning, the first thing you asked this morning is, are we positive or negative? Are we optimistic yeah. or not? So I'm hugely optimistic, hugely optimistic. We have to be optimistic, but I'm hugely optimistic that we can do what we need to do. We need to answer those, pre that, that, those five questions I just put up and think them, about them at all times, but I'm hugely optimistic. So I don't want to bias your response to this question, <laughs> but the question is, I believe <laughs> that health research can support better, stronger, and fairer climate policy and drive ambitious climate action at speed. I love that. And indeed, Thank with you. an emphasis, even... Uh, yes, let's do a round of applause, <laughs> especially because you, you initiated it. <laughs> That's leadership, I'm telling you, that's leadership.
I love that. Also, um, just just one thing I want to reiterate because I really loved how you said that, and it keeps on recurring and coming back. So I really think it's something that we cannot, you know, leave in this room and forget when we all go back. But it's really the point about having policy literate scientists. So as you said, not esoteric big questions to see what would happen if I tweak this and what will happen to that. But really, uh, perhaps with a, with a, with an aim to change policy for the better because the urgency is so big. But your statement, Ellen, it's a very good one. Uh, I explained at the start what we do with the statement. I'll read it once more for you. If you agree with the statement, you stand up. And if you disagree, I cannot guarantee your safety as to what Ellen will do to you. So don't look at me if something happens. So once more, I believe that health research can support better, stronger, and fairer climate policy and drive ambitious climate action at speed. There you go, no! <laughs> I'm, I'm having a, an eye-to-eye -eye moment with Jan Cement, who's still <laughs> firmly seated. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't want to say... Oh, you're seated. Oh, there are a couple. There are some people that are uh, still seated. May I ask you who you are? And, and you agree with the statement. Why? Yes, I do. I'm Lisbeth Hall, and I work for the Dutch National Institute of Public Health and the Environment, the oh, RIVM. Right. Yeah. And I agree. But I think it's not just to do with the quality of our research, but yeah. also to do with us and how brave and bold we are to mm. get out there and get our message across, right. across and yeah. make sure we translate it yeah. so that others understand our message. I love that. That also yeah. taps into what Joanna Drake said this morning, right? Yeah. Our individual ability to respond. Do we take exactly, that? Like yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the boundary spanners, which Francesca mentioned. Francesca Okay, yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, oh exactly. my god, I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> you. Sir, you, you even called out to me and said, hey, notice me, I am seated, I disagree. Please, will you stand up uh, and say sure. why you disagree? No, I, 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 uh, I, I would like to agree. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we have a serious problem we have not been talking about in these two days. It's that uh, not of data availability hmm. on health, but of data use. Data use. Uh, for reason of privacy, for reason of, uh, for several reasons, uh, it is difficult that uh, uh, health data are shared among uh, researchers. Hmm. While climate data are more accessible, yeah. health data are not so accessible. Mm. So uh, I would like that uh, health research can support better, stronger, and fairer climate policy. Yeah. But to produce this kind of evidence, we should have more access to data. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that point. And, and who are you and where are you uh, from? I'm uh, Stefano Campostrini from uh, University of Foscari, Venice. Okay, thank you so much. Alan, would you like to respond yeah, to I'd that? I'd love uh, to respond to that. So just quickly, uh, I'm very proud that uh, last year we announced funding for the DHIS2, which is the de uh, Demographic Health uh, uh, District, excuse me, District Health Information Systems. It has health data on three and a half billion people. Wow. Uh, and we are supporting the integration of climate data into that health system, into that health, that digital uh, uh, information system, so that health decisions can be made climate informed. And in fact, the interesting thing about that is the health data are available and the climate data are quite difficult to access. So the reverse of what you're saying. But I think your point about data availability is really, really important. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for raising the point. I mean, I, I, I couldn't uh, resist the urge <laughs> to find you, Jan, because <laughs> you were also seated. Would you like to share why? Could you stand up for a second so that the... Uh... Um, well, <clears throat> of course, I would will, I will love to believe it. The, the thing is, ambitious climate action at speed, right? The speed is the issue. Uh, I've been working on this for 30 years. Mm. I started 30 years ago. <laughs> and what has happened? Not much. And there's one girl who came along, Greta Thunberg. She changed the field. So mm. I don't know if we will drive it. I think youth activist, you will drive it. Mm. You know, that's where we're at. Mm. That's what I believe in. Okay, I like that. There is indeed, oh, I see one of the young scientists clapping for that. <laughs> indeed, we can get a round of applause. Yeah. Let's do it, folks. Thank you so much, Jan. Thanks. Ellen, would you like to, uh, you agree? No, I, oh, I agree good? completely. So, okay. so it's, a, it's I, I believe, I hope it's so. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to believe it. Yeah, but I like that. You hope it's so, and we got to believe it, because if we don't, then... Uh, we're putting ourselves one meter away or maybe a lot of meters beneath sea level away from, sorry, that's uh, becoming very dystopian, but yeah. <laughs> we're making it more difficult for ourselves is yeah, what I'm trying exactly. to say. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Everybody, you. can Thank we have you. a big round of applause for Alan Denger? Thank you so much, Alan. 
Okay, um, the scene has been set. Uh, a lot of lessons that we heard there, policy literate scientist, but also the point about, I really like the, the, question, the questions that you asked at the end because I think it, uh, it gives us some things to reflect on, uh, even as a community here that hopefully are the, the bandwidth spanners, the boundary spanners was the word, yes, thanks Elizabeth. Um, because if we are the boundary spanners, let's say, I hope we are, um, and we can't raise our hands to all those questions, then I think we still also got some working to do. With that being said, I am very excited and thrilled to announce our next speaker to the stage. Not Ellen Dengour again, but somebody else. Gwen Coleman, she is the director at the Office of Scientific Coordination at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Give her a big round of applause, everyone. Good luck. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I am from the National Institutes of Health, and I'll tell you a little bit about our agency and the work that we're doing, um, and then uh, also talk about how I think the agendas that all of our agencies have are so similar. And when I first started in this role, I thought similar was not a good thing. I thought it was overlapping and redundant, and we'd all be doing the same thing, and you know, it wouldn't work. But in fact. Over time, seeing the complementarity of all of the agency's agendas and understanding the different audiences and communities that each of us have, I think brings much more strength and more attention to the issue from multiple perspectives. But at the bottom line, we all have the same values and we all have the same strategies and we're all really trying to do the same thing. So we may use different words and we may use different funding approaches, but I think, you know, as I, I tell grantees, you need to diversify your stock portfolio. You can't invest just in one thing, and you can't go to just one agency. And I think the, the beauty here is, is that because this is such an urgent problem, it's, it's such a wicked, wild, um, over, you know, just the, wild, the biggest thing I think I've ever worked on, um, I think having more people who are interested in investing and uh, working together with the communities and bringing everyone together is just the most positive thing that we can do. So let me tell you a little bit about us. We, um, so in the US, the National Institutes of Health is the uh, major biomedical funder. We are an institute collaborate, uh, a consortium of 27 different institutes that cover a variety of health outcomes and constituent factors. I personally work at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and for probably most of my career, when, the health, when environmental health was spoken of, the only people who really addressed it was my institute. And then the climate problem comes, and the other institutes are not really that interested over the last number of years. They're focused on treatments, they're focused on drug development, they're focusing on you know, the, the patho pathological issues of their disease, and there are many important questions there, but now you know, this impacts everybody and it impacts every disease outcome. And so here when we look at the direct effects we're talking about from climate that we've heard about over the last day and a half, every single institute at the National Institutes of Health has some Something in the game here. But never before in my career time and perhaps of others have we asked these other institute directors to come together and sit at the table together and think collectively about how we can use the power and um, influence of our own agencies to bring this, these questions to a much, much broader audience. So our NIH Wide Climate and Health Initiative has 12 directors on an executive committee that are providing governance for our program. We have over 200 people across the NIH in an active working group. Uh, again, unprecedented, unheard of, and we meet monthly, um, and we have a very active steering committee that represents all of the institutes at the NIH, developing funding announcements, working with grantee communities. Our intramural program, we have laboratories at each of these institutes. We're doing in-house research, and we're building capacity even among the NIH staff who have never thought about these questions before. So it's really, um, it's really the time for this, and it's really uh, gratifying and rewarding to see the response of the other institutes uh, here. So at NIEHS, we're also talking about the indirect effects. We're talking about uh, what happens when climate comes into communities that already have environmental health burdens chemical toxicants, other, you know, air quality, water issues. Um, what happens when climate factors come and uh, 
multiply the effects. It's really a threat multiplier, and it, it you know, impacts uh, communities of all kinds. So um, I heard recently we had a conference uh, just uh, at the beginning of the month, and Vanessa Kelly said that, uh, she was, Carrie, she was uh, one of our plenary speakers, and she said, climate change impacts every single person on this planet. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the gist of it. And we talk about this too, everybody is at risk, but not everybody is equally at risk. Because there are some communities who are inherently because of the resources and resilience that they already have, and people within any population, there's a, there's a spectrum of vulnerability. So some people are not as great, or as great risk as others. But our program is very interested in understanding this from a health equity lens, and so we're really focusing on a variety of different underserved populations, those who already have health disparities, in any of those diseases that I had on the previous slide. Uh, there's been some discussion about workers uh, in earlier sessions here, of course, where we're interested in those. People with disabilities, people across the lifespan, so from prenatal, fetal impacts, all the way through older adults. People with medical conditions, chronic medical conditions, are they taking medications, they have uh, you know, health services that they get. Uh, those are all disrupted with many of the climate factors that we're talking about, whether they be acute weather events or the not so acute recurring heat problems that we're seeing probably every year. And then of course, a, a lot of discussion over the last two days about populations in low middle income countries. And at our NIH, we have the Fogarty International Center and they particularly are interested in the global populations in the global south and they're constantly reminding us that our program is not just a US based domestic issue, it's a worldwide issue and then they bring their expertise to the table. So the overall goals of our program are to expand funding. You know, just quick stop right there. There hasn't been enough money flowing out of the NIH and so we have a renewed interest in expanding the funding. Uh, we want to create new knowledge. We talked about evidence gaps. Well, again, across a whole spectrum. Everything from basic biological mechanisms of, of vulnerability all the way to the solutions-driven research that leads to action is what we've been talking about today. And so these, I won't go through all these in detail, but these are the objectives of our program. And then there are some core values that we have in, in um, developing these programs. And so we um, developed a strategic framework for the program and we use COGS. Alan, I saw you use COGS in your diagram before too, so I feel good about that as well. Um, these COGS are important because at the heart of the matter is what I think almost every speaker here today has talked about, what, or yesterday and today, talked about the, the across the disciplines and transdisciplinary research. So funders can say that, we can all say it's important, but somebody has to put their money where their mouth is, and funders have the ability to do that, to direct people to come together. And a lot of the things that we've built over the last two, two years and we're launching are solely to get those teams going. If you bring in communities that have never thought about these questions before, they certainly have never worked with climate scientists, and they haven't worked with other people across the disciplines that are necessary in order to to generate evidence for interventions or solutions. Uh, health equity, of course, is important, and we think about vulnerabilities and uh, justice, uh, just solutions. And so I just urge you to go to this website and read the strategic plan for yourself. Hopefully you'll see yourself there, uh, and you can see how the, the work that you're doing uh, integrates with the work that we're doing. So this is my last slide. This is just a distribution of the funds. We had $40 million appropriation from Congress last year. We put a lot of money out in lots of different kinds of programs. Team building, transdisciplinary science, community engagement, working with communities, all of the different values that we've heard others have spoken about. We're putting our money where our mouth is and we're launching this program. And we also have a stream of funding for individual investigator research to work on the questions that you think are most appropriate in your laboratories or in your communities. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Give a big round of applause, everyone. Thank you so much, Gwen. And if I'm not mistaken, you've also brought a statement I with did. you, right? There you go. There it is. I'm also checking to see, I left my microphone here, <laughs> but take a moment to read it because uh, I think we're specifically focusing on the last uh, marked bit of the statement, uh, which is, it is essential for members of affected communities to be involved at all stages in the research and translation of those findings. Take a moment to think. 
And now you know the drill, folks. If you agree with the statement, please stand up. And if you disagree, remain seated. And now I say freeze, because at some point I keep on telling you, people are just thinking, oh no, too many people around me are standing up. I don't want to be the single one out. <laughs> Hi, can I ask you? Sure. You're still, uh, uh, would you like to stand up, tell us who you are, and you disagree with the statement? Or you were still thinking? Well, I was, I was, I was, I was still thinking, but uh, my name is Aleksandra Kazmierczak. I'm from the European Environment Agency, and I'm very much for the justice and equity. I'm just thinking whether it's essential for the actual members of the affected communities or the representatives to be involved, and how feasible it would be, for example, for the policymakers at the national level to engage the individual mm. members of affected yeah. communities, or should it be done via working uh, with the uh, civil, civil society organizations, for example, yeah. that do represent the rights of yeah. those communities. But I do agree that they should be involved. So if I understand you correctly, from a justice perspective, yes, absolutely, but from a feasibility perspective, you have some questions. Okay. E yes, probably. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Would you like to reply to that or respond to that, uh, uh, Gwen? Sure. I, I thank you for your comments, and uh, they're important. Um, I believe around Should the world it's different. The engagement can be different. It's di can, uh, one way in the United States is not necessarily the way in Europe, not in the lower middle income countries. Um, we do have evidence, our institute has funded lots of science where members of the community, either uh, themselves or represented by community-based organizations in the environmental justice space, actually sit down with researchers at the table and co-create, talk about their lived experiences so the investigators have a true sense of what, where they think the urgency is and the problem. And then they bring other translational partners into these teams. So the policymakers, the mm. healthcare providers, other people who need to be involved uh, in conducting the research in order for the end users to have the data that they need. Yeah. So again, we're working in our space trying to understand what those different strategies look like around the world, and we, meant, we mean to be inclusive and yeah. you know, uh, important for it to be culturally competent and for the local area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we have somebody here that also agrees with the statement. Yes, Would you like I to? do. And I come from the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, so I was quite glad to see the workers there mm. on your list. That's nice. an important yeah. issue. And I'd like to say you are a worker, I am a worker, we are all workers in here. And did you know that your employer needs to consult you on the climate change adaptation measures? We all have heat at work, for example. I, are there measures in place? Are you consulted? Mm. This is an important issue, and I should think it should go into the research agenda. Mm. Occupational safety and health is really an important area. Thank you yeah. for raising that. That's a very good point. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much to you, Gwen. Uh, can we have once more a big round of applause for an amazing presentation and a very good statement? And so we move on. We move on along the track of time to become very philosophical <laughs> to our next speaker. And I'm very, very excited to introduce her to the stage. She is the Group Director of Partnerships at External Affairs at Omref Health Africa. Please. And she's here. She's here already behind me. Give it up for Desta Laku, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and I, I, I'm so thrilled, actually, to come right after two of the major funders of research, um, because now we have them in the room uh, as we're talking about our needs uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and actually all of Africa. So great to see you both here, um, and, and happy to be here as well. For those of you who may not know uh, about AMREF, I work with AMREF Health Africa. We're Africa's largest health development international NGO. We are headquartered in Kenya. Um, and we work in about 35 countries, running about, I would say, 140 projects across those different countries, serving about 30 million people annually. And we deal with those who are in the last mile, those who are most disenfranchised, and those who least have access to direct care services. So our role really is to work with government, people like the Honorable Minister Chiponda. We work very well with her. We have an office in Malawi. So we work with our ministries of health and other ministries as well, since we do capacity building, 
to ensure that the people who most need it have access to first level care. So at simply, simply put, we connect people to first level care and we address everything else surrounding that access or lack of access. So that's what we do. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me see if I can uh, change this. So today actually, I want to discuss with you, and we've been more and more involved in climate. In fact, in the last year, we've really accelerated our engagement in climate. We were involved in COP29. We, we were a health envoy for the COP presidency. We were organizing as part of the health day, the first health day. We worked very closely with ministries of health and the Africa group of negotiators to develop a common position in a meeting that was hosted by the government of Malawi. So in one year, we've really done quite a bit of work around climate change and health and that interaction. Many of you will know that climate was not really considered part of the health conversation at all. And many of our ministers of health and other leadership in this space didn't have the language to actually address the impact of climate on health. So for us, starting out, and when we think about agriculture, for example, it took agriculture 10 years to be on that agenda. So we're really doing a good job in health. I must say that has a lot to do with our partners. So the, the things that we are seeing as AMREF and, and some of the most critical things are is that health, um, climate is probably one of the most critical social determinants of health that we are seeing today in our life. Increasing disease burdens, we've seen, we heard it last, uh, yesterday. We estimated numbers of death rising, economic loss, we can even quantify it in terms of uh, economy. And it's an existential challenge that is framed by a number of different things, which we saw during the pandemic, which is a very fragmented and fragile health system. So we're really working on the impact of climate against a health system that is very fragmented and very fragile. And health workers, not enough health workers, young population, urbanization, migration and conflict. So there are many different things that are affecting our ability to deliver for our communities uh, that relate to climate. So when we look at what are the main gaps, and I'm not a researcher, so I stand on the shoulder of those proud people who declared they were not researchers earlier. Um, so, what are some of the main research and innovation gaps that we see in Africa? So, of course, there are the usual factors. One is, you know, we don't have technical and financial capacity. We need funding. Um, we don't have access to scientific tools and infrastructure. We don't have dissemination. Dissemination is an issue. You know, there are many Africans who are involved in research but they are not able to actually publish. So even if you look at the IPCC, the recent report, only 11% of those scientists are from Africa. So you th we, th we look at you know, things like funding. You know, if you look at Africa-related climate funding, only 14.5% flowed to African institutions. Yesterday, we had a bigger group. We had about 450 people, I think, in here. And I looked around and I did a back of the envelope calculation. And if I can ask right now, all of those of you who are from Africa to please stand up. Okay, so when you look at research funding, only 4% actually goes to Africa, of all African researchers. So if we look at this room and we say, these are all people who get funding on climate. It's only those few that stood that actually come from Africa. Everyone else comes from Europe, North America, etc. So it's really too important to understand that as a continent that is being impacted significantly by climate, we are the least funded for anything to do with climate. So it's important for us, even as we move forward, it's important for us to understand that and address it. We have indigenous knowledge. Our people live with the land. They have you know, one health. How are we incorporating that into the research design 
uh, and, the, and the research elements that we deal with from A to Z. Yeah? So we miss out on indigenous knowledge. The community has been seeing the impact of climate change in every which way possible that we could not imagine. Yes. And I think for us, it's how do we, how do we, um, how do we really increase our adaptive capacity in one way or another? So the opportunity, I know our time is getting up, the opportunity really that I see is number one, we are establishing a center for policy research and public health so that within our AMREF International University, for example, so we can coordinate research and innovation, action on climate and other public health issues. We feel like we need to leverage citizen knowledge and science at the center of everything that we do. We do this currently by community-based observatory networks, using community health workers, et cetera. We need to make sure there's an opportunity here for us to provide data and science to inform regional and continental or national policies on climate. And we need to engage governments and policymakers so that we can translate the findings of research so that they can actually use that for policy development. So these are some of the shifts that we need to mobilize. Sustainable partnerships, for me, that is the most critical thing that we need to do at this point. We need to really leverage and unite resources, expertise, innovative thinking. These are the things that we need to bring together, like we're doing here, with people that have not sat together before. Um, we need to develop standardized metrics, indicators, targets, etc. We need to better understand how involving community and citizen needs can really actually improve the research design, uh, the um, efficacy, the, the value add of it. And then we need to do more convening such as this so that we can bring different minds together so that we can accomplish more. Yeah. And finally, key recommendations, I'll leave this up here. Look beyond the health sector for solutions, integrate community knowledge into research and innovation, dedicate greater funding and resources, and share intellectual property rights to advance research. And Thank that's so it. Much. Yes. Thank you so much, Thank Desta. You. Thank you so much. Yes, can we have a big round of applause? Um, and I actually put this up here, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this afterwards, but that this is, is an example. Yeah of how we use our community and research and some of our findings recently yeah. in northern Kenya. I think that would definitely be appreciated. There are also a lot of questions coming in. I think you've really sparked um, yeah, some inspiration and reflection for a lot of people. Uh, thank you also so much. It feels uh, a bit... Um, a bit of a bummer to not be able to, to listen to you for longer because it's so incredibly important, the point that you're raising. Also, the 4% statistic, to me, that's baffling, honestly. So uh, I'm actually very happy that you're raising it here because it's so fundamental when we talk about, you know, the future of, um, you know, also the research agendas and innovation uh, strategies that will be drafted, but also the work that each and every one of you do, uh, does. So thanks for raising it. You also brought a statement. That's uh, I did, but she beat me to it. Yes. <laughs> so I highlighted another bit of your statement as well. Yes. Um, maybe I'll just read it for the room and then uh, I'll ask for the same drill because uh, specifically the first bit is the bit that we want you to think about and that is qualitative research and tools that accommodate citizens slash community knowledge is critical to further the climate and health research and innovation agenda. If you agree, please stand up. And if you disagree, please remain seated. Let us see who dares. No, I'm joking. I should stop doing that. It's so not neutral. Every, every stance is welcomed. Okay, freeze, I would say. And uh, let's hear from some people on why they say what they say. And let me venture a little bit to the back side of the room. Um, y you're making eye contact with me. I don't like this. Oh, you, I, I spoke to you yesterday, I think. Yeah, yeah, we know each other. Okay, then I'll go <laughs> to the back. Would you like to share? Um, I wasn't making eye contact. <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> That's a, you see, it doesn't matter which strategy. Sorry. Um, well, I don't know. It's hard not to agree. I can't mm. say anything else. I'm yeah. sure it's, it's important. Like, so many other things are important. So yeah. it's, it leaves... It, brings us again to the same thing, like where do we start? Like yeah. How do we organize all of that? Right, so it's a given, you would say. It's just more uh, how do we get there then indeed. Is there somebody that's still seated then, actually? Um, you are still seated. 
I was standing. Oh, you were standing? Yeah, okay, <laughs> you did? Standing. Okay, no, no. No, actually, I, I'd like to comment on this because a lot of my work is qualitative. Yeah. And I get, I get a lot of colleagues coming talking about big data and a lot of time missing the importance of mm. understanding subjective responses to climate change or right. impacts of health. So I think it's a good point also in terms of understanding different social intersectional positions. Yeah. So within a household, who mm. represents that household? Who represents mm. a community? Yeah. Who represents uh, a nation or That's a country? That's a very good point. Yeah, I like that. Thanks for raising that as well. Thank you all so much. Um, we have to continue because the time. But uh, thank you so much. I would say this, that uh, uh, you've done a good job at uh, convincing, uh, convincing everyone, I shall say. So thank you so much. Can we once more have a big round of applause? Thank you so much. Now, time flies, uh, and I know that you uh, can already smell the cooking of lunch in the back, but not be before we go over to ne our next speaker, because he has some interesting facts cooking for you as well in his presentation. Uh, and that is why it is with great pleasure that I would like to welcome to the stage Michael Makanga, who is the Executive Director at Global Health ECD TP3 Joint Undertaking. Give a big round of applause, everybody, to Michael. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the um, introduction and the invitation. And uh, thanks to the organizers for this session. I'll start off, with, uh, start off by saying that uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because I came to draw inspiration from this conference, and secondly, to do something about it. The organization that uh, I represent is the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. This is the third program, that is the Global Health EDCTP3. And briefly, I'll speak to you about the investing in health research and enhancing cooperation or collaboration with Africa to tackle climate change related infections. The Global Health EDCTP3 is a partnership that involves the European Commission that is representing the European Union and the EDCTP Association that represents governments, European governments and African governments participating in the association. And uh, this is a program that has been running now for 21 years. And uh, the third program uh, which I'm going to talk to you about, started three years ago, building on the three iterations of the program. And the Global Health EDS TP3 works to deliver new solutions to reduce the burden of infectious diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa and to strengthen research capacities to prepare and respond to re-emerging and emerging infectious diseases. So the program, uh, supports all elements that are required to develop and evaluate medical interventions against key infectious diseases that affect Sub-Saharan Africa through clinical science or clinical research, research capacity development, and networking, both north-south and south-south networking. And our target diseases include HIV AIDS, TB, malaria, neglected infectious diseases that are on the priority list of WHO, um, diarrhea diseases and lower respiratory tract infections, emerging and re-emerging infections affecting Sub-Saharan Africa. And within this scope, we have the overarching um, areas like antimicrobial resistance and climate crisis provoked changes in infectious disease um, incidents and issues related to quay infections and comorbidities. In this case, climate change related infections have already been incorporated uh, in the new program and we are taking account the rising importance of this issue and to ensure that the availability of funding related to this, uh, to us to address these research questions uh, is made available. So one of the reasons, as I said, I'm here 
is to ensure that we have action towards some of the areas that are highlighted. I don't have to labor this too much, but just to remind us of the unique vulnerabilities that face Africa uh, to the effects of climate change. We've heard already about the life-threatening infectious diseases uh, that, are project, uh, that are projected to spread further, including uh, dengue. We've heard a lot about effects of malaria. We've heard about the situation of cholera in Malawi and in other countries, and many other infectious diseases that are being um, really reignited by the effects of climate change. Research within the continent faces severe challenges due to lack of or limited access to data and limited funding for new technologies to address, to address them. And uh, we know that these are multifaceted uh, elements and we need to do more about them. Uh, we know uh, from, the, um, uh, from the Lancet countdown that only 10% of peer-reviewed articles exploring the links between climate and health we are focused on Africa. We need to do something about this to bridge this gap. The death threat from climate change is 60 to 80 percent higher in Africa than it is in the next most vulnerable region, that is Southeast Asia, due to the pre-existing vulnerabilities and the weakened ability of Africa to adapt the impacts of climate change. Uh, this has been uh, clearly articulated in the African Union climate change and resilience development strategy and action document. We don't have to leave this in the papers, we need to do something about it. On the side of um, EDSDP program, I have to say that uh, we have listened and we know that the time is right. We have positive policy developments on climate and health and um, we have the uh, this policy development that have been well articulated, and EDCTP, in this case, is going to do some. Is already doing something about it. We've launched calls in these areas, but we want to do more on terms of clinical research, the related capacity that is required to prepare, and doing this in an interdisciplinary manner, and also to ensure that we have the networking happening. And this has to be a joint responsibility for the global research community and working in partnership with all like-minded organizations to generate evidence, to strengthen the capacity, to support evidence-informed policy development, and in this case, ensuring that we do not forget what we've been reminded uh, in these few days, uh, not to stop on uh, impact research, but also to go on to address the other areas that have been highlighted here, and to establish networks and strengthen the existing ones by exploring complementarities and synergies. You can uh, follow up more on our work, and I'll end with my statement. Can we have a big round of applause for everyone from Michael Makanga? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. You indeed also have a statement for the room. Um, I like this because this was, there was a lot in here, but in a good way. Um, so we, we, again, we have a marked section for the room. It's, it's a good sign. If people would have short things, then I'm, well, I think, no, it's good because <laughs> it means you've thought about it. And especially the latter part, I think, is an interesting one because it speaks to the role of global funders, right? Uh, and it says global funders and policy makers must continue to support and urgently prioritize research into the effects of climate change on health to inform the establishment of context-specific solutions. That's correct. That's a given, right? Do you think people will disagree? Well, some may. Okay, well, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Maybe we can turn it around. If you disagree now, stand up. No, it's going to make it harder, actually. <laughs> but can we actually turn it around? Because I was curious when I read it, would there be people that disagree? So if you agree, you remain seated. And if you disagree, you stand up. Oh, Desta? No, no, oh. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. I have a microphone for you. No, no, no. You have a comment. I just have a comment. So it's not about disagreement, but I think to separate, global funders should prioritize research and funding for research. But I think the policymakers need to really focus on translating the data 
so that it can inform mm. policy, right? So, so I would just separate those two. Roles. But I hundred look, I have to leave this room with this man uh, ne near me somewhere, so I wouldn't disagree <laughs> with him. But I, I would just separate those okay, two. Okay, so you agree, just for the record, Michael, for she agreed. How, do you want to respond to that, to the separation of roles? So the funding for, uh, for the funders, but the policymakers have a role of translation. How do you look at that? Uh, do you want to use this? You disagree also. Please, uh, if you want to go, Michael, and respond, then I will go Let here. me first take the second question, too. I'll hold it for you. I'll hold it for you. Oh, first, you want to take this? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for your good presentation. Considering that we are from Africa, and you are also in an indigenous African, and in your presentation, you have indicated that it's only 10%. Mm. Uh, of, the research, of research that, that is published, that is uh, from using the African context. Right. I would have preferred if you had indicated an establishment of African context-specific solutions on your statement. Thank you. Maybe you want to provide some. Thank you so much also for your question. Please go ahead. Thank Michael. you very much for asking these questions. And I have to say that when this was, was formulated, uh, it was also with the idea to provoke you into this. <laughs> I was uh, all planned this. <laughs> the program that I represent is a joint undertaking that represents the European Commission representing the Union and the EDCTP Association representing African governments and European governments. But who are the people that are representing these governments? They are policymakers. Mm. that are informing the, risk, the agenda to be funded. So the two are integral. Right. In okay. this case, uh, in one hand, we need to take responsibility on the side of the policymakers to embrace the idea of funding of research, but also translating the results that come out of the research into policy and practice. Right, okay. And to the second and question. to the second question. Uh, I have to say that, again, uh, the program I represent speaks exactly to this. We support all phases of clinical development, but more so late stage product development and post-registration studies that take into account contextualized studies. And that is why, at this point in time, we really want to embrace incorporation of climate change into all facets of our research in late stage development and implementation of interventions that go out there. So I'm all for what you're saying. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you also for the question. I think we've ended on a note where Desta can still peacefully have lunch together with Michael and Michael with Desta, so that's a good thing. <laughs> but can I get a big round of applause, Michael Makanga, everyone? And thank you so much. Thank you. That was an amazing presentation also. Now, everybody, that brings us towards the end of this plenary session. But do not worry. There is a lot more content in store for you today. In a little bit, we'll have lunch. Now, before you run off, uh, I just want to mention that we have a new round of posters up during lunch. But even more importantly, all the rounds for posters will be up. So you can actually see what category a poster belongs to because it has a colored marker, either blue, orange, or green. But just go check them out. If you see one that you really like, take out Slido and make sure that you vote for your favorite one. You can see the corresponding numbers or the corresponding authors, names of the research on there. So uh, I have no doubt that you'll be able to find them. But do make sure to vote. Uh, after the, the lunch break, we have parallel sessions and the lunch ends at a quarter past two. So enjoy that for now. And then we'll be, ba we'll be back with you soon enough here as well. Thank you so much. Thanks.